the big question that we are answering this week is understanding what functions can, and more interestingly, cannot be computed by this Turing machine model, which seems like a powerful model of computing. And we'll actually see that it's as powerful as necessary to capture some large intuitive sense of what machines can compute. So that's where we're going over the next two classes. We're going to start by a little bit of recap. We've seen a bunch of computing models. We started with Boolean circuits. Those correspond to things that we might be able to build with transistors. But we have a mathematical model, and we can describe all circuits as the set of nodes and edges. It's a graph where we're doing some simple operation at all the nodes. And we can define the computing model. We need two pieces. We need some way of showing what we can represent and what it means to execute. What it means to execute is how we get from a representation of our computing model and maybe some input to an output. Okay, and we've seen that for Boolean circuits. We've seen that for the NAND circ language. Here, our representation is really simple. It's lines of this form. Our computing model tells us how to take a NAND circ program, evaluate it, and get an output. Each function that we can define with our NAND circ or our Boolean circuit model is finite. Right? It works for a finite number of inputs. So we could always just do a lookup table. But it's still interesting to look at what circuits can do more compactly. We started looking at unbounded models of computation, where with some short finite description, we can now define a computing model that can work on inputs of any size. And we had a finite state machine where we can roughly describe how to evaluate with a few short lines of Pythonic code. So certainly that's not a precise mathematical definition of how to evaluate a finite state machine, because it assumes we know what all sorts of complicated things like for loops mean and in going through input bits. But we could define that more precisely mathematically, but it should correspond to your understanding of what it means for a Python program to execute and a precise notion of what it means to evaluate a finite state machine. And then last class, we started talking about Turing machines, which add to the finite state machine some memory, some memory that's unbounded. And we can think of that as being a tape, which goes on forever. So all of these are models of computation. So what's the purpose of these models? What are we modeling? Normally when we think of building models, right? most of science is about building models. We're trying to build models to understand something. Is that what we're doing here? We've spent about half a semester talking about models of computing. I hope there's some good reason for doing that. Because if there's not, then you should have been taking some other class. So what conceivable value could these models have? Yeah. Are these model thinking? Model thinking? Okay. Thinking like what goes on in your brain. That's an interesting way of thinking about it. So how close do they come? If our goal is to model how humans think, at least all of us have some intuitive sense of how humans think, because we're humans and presumably we have thought at some point. How good are these models? Do these correspond well if our goal is to model human thinking? Probably not. It, was, it doesn't feel like how I think I think. None of these models are too close to that. Maybe at some deeper level, we could think about whether any of these models, of the models we've seen, which one is closest to modeling human thinking? I see. OK, yeah. If we think about modeling what's going on in a brain, now we know a little bit about neuroscience as opposed to what we intuitively think is happening when we're thinking. Right? And you had, I think, on um, one of the problem sets, a question about can we implement something like a Boolean circuit using our model of an artificial neuron? So in that sense, maybe it's kind of a way we could think about how we think. Definitely, our brain is finite. So any of these infinite models probably have some problems. We, we don't have, we have a lot of memory in our head, but it's definitely not infinite. So what else? If, if it seems like if our goal is to model human thought, this is not where we should have started or where we should have gone. Yeah. I'm surprised no one, no one gave the answer, and I think most of you are computer science majors, that we want to model computers. That would be the most, at least, the answer I would have most expected to get. It's too obvious. Okay, that's why no one gave that answer. Uh, either that or it's been a long it's uh, it's been a long week it's already Monday afternoon certainly modeling computers is useful if we want to 
build computing systems and have them work and be able to reason about what they can do, having some kind of model for that might be useful. But Turing came up with this model of a, a Turing machine, which he called an automatic machine, in the 1930s. Right? He was not modeling computers. There were some sort of glimmers of computing machines starting to happen. There, there actually were computing machines going back to the 1600s. But that's not what a computer meant in Turing's day. He was trying to model something else. And let me just have a little detail. If you think of scientific models, these are all models of the universe. Right? They go back thousands of years. Which one's the best? Why is Einstein's the best? Yeah. So it's the one that is closest as far as we can measure to physical reality. Is it the most useful model for most of what we do every day? No, right? Part of the goal of a model in science is to understand physical reality. So the most useful model is the one that matches closest. Another part of the goal of a model is to be something simple that we can use to reason about things that matter in our life or in, in, that we're building. Right? And there are some things, like if you're building GPS, you better worry about Einstein's model. If you're building a bridge, you're probably OK with Newton's model. If you spend your time worrying about quantum relativity when you're designing a bridge, you're probably not going to build a good bridge. For understanding the seasons and stuff, maybe Copernicus' model is better. Ptolemy's model is not a desired model for anything we do today, but it was pretty good for a long time. So this is what Turing was modeling. Computers in the 1930s were humans who did calculations. This is the Bonus Bureau Computing Division, 1924. Does anyone know what the Bonus Bureau was doing with all these human computers? What would you guess the Bonus Bureau is doing? They were calculating bonuses. This is how they figured out how big a check to send to the veterans. Right? So this is calculating the bonuses for veterans of the Army. You needed, and I don't know if this is everyone, but you needed a pretty big room of people to calculate those bonuses. That is something we would think, yeah, you can probably write a very short program. Like, I don't know exactly how complicated the rules of bonuses, but it's probably just some very simple function of how long they served and what rank they were. And you would be done. But you needed a room of people like that. But two things to notice, and this is if you're thinking about model. They, they, had, they had little machines. They had infinite rolls of tape, or at least they had scratch storage to do their work. But there were people following rules to do these calculations. So this is from Turing's paper from 1936. And we're going to show you various quotes of this that explain why he came up with the model he did. But it's also been a very long-lasting and useful model. This is what he's modeling. He was writing about elementary arithmetic, what kids do in school, where they might be dividing their paper into squares and following some procedure to do division or multiplication or something. This is from the paper which introduced this model. Turing did not call it a Turing machine. That would have been arrogant and presumptuous. He called it an automatic machine or a machine. The goal of the paper was not about modeling computation. The reason that he came up with this model and needed a formal model of computation was to answer this question of what numbers can be computed, thinking about what it means to compute a number as we can describe that number in a finite way. Right? So if you have some finite program, some finite set of instructions that you're going to follow in a mechanical way, which remember that means human computers following it, writing down what they're doing on scratch paper, the question of what can and cannot be computed, what numbers you can produce. So this was the question that drove the model. The intuitive notion of a computable number is a number that we can write down. We can have a machine write that number down, and it's a finite machine. We'll look at some examples of computable numbers soon. But this is the model. This was introduced last class. I'm going to write it using the notation that's in the book. So we have an alphabet. That's a finite set of symbols. The way it's defined in the book, which is a little non-traditional, is there's always these four symbols in that set. The alphabet is a superset of 0, 1, which are the values we use for the input. And then this symbol, which unfortunately looks a lot like a 0, you can think of as a blank. Right? That's a square that doesn't start with anything in it. And then there's a special symbol that's a triangle that's used for the start of the tape. Nothing other than 0, 1 is necessary. We need two symbols. 
we can do everything else, but it makes, makes life simpler to have those extra symbols. But the key part of the machine is the transition function. And the transition function is what tells us how to execute the machine. This is just the representation of the machine. For this to be a model computation, we have to say what it does. But we have a function that takes in a state and a read symbol. There are two things that determine what the machine's gonna do next. So it outputs the next state. This is the symbol that's written and a move. Right, so you can move left, you can move right, you can stay where you are. That's also optional. And I, I think I would prefer the definition without a stay where you are, but that's what the book uses. And then the halt is when you're done. And so far we've only defined the representation. What it means as a computing model depends on saying, well, now you've described the machine like this. You describe a machine by giving the transition function. And then we want to say, well, what does it mean for that machine to execute? But before we do that, we want to answer two questions. Both the alphabet and the states are finite. So why is the alphabet finite? Why not allow an infinite number of symbols in the alphabet? So there is more than the meaning be unclear. What else would be unclear if there are infinitely many symbols? So certainly mathematically, we can do a lookup. A lookup is a function, right? And we have plenty of functions that take any natural number and output something. So there's no reason we couldn't do a lookup that's infinite. And in fact, we're going to need one for the tape, right? The tape is basically an infinite lookup function. So that isn't quite the reason. Yeah. So we can certainly define total functions on infinitely large sets of input. Addition is one example, right? So let me, let me give you one more, more hint, because I think we're not quite going in the right track. Remember that our tape is divided into squares. And let's assume the squares are all the same size. Why can't we have infinitely many different symbols? Good, yeah. Right. We've got to be able to read the symbols. So if we have infinitely many different symbols that we can fit in one of these little boxes, well, at some point, the difference between any two symbols is going to get so small we can't tell it apart. That's the justification Turing used to say why the alphabet has to be finite. And I think it's, it's a pretty good one. Otherwise, there's not a real justification for this. And if you could have infinitely many symbols, well, that would open up lots of questions about, well, now you've got to define a transition function. Maybe the symbols can encode things in different ways. But if you make it finite, then all those problems go away. And if it's finite, well, you can have two or you can have 100 million. It's the same thing. Right? If it was infinite, things would get more complicated. So this is how Turing said that. So he's assuming the tape's divided into squares. And if we allowed an infinity of symbols, then they would differ by some arbitrarily small extent, and we couldn't tell them apart. He gives a nice example of we can make 999 a single symbol but it's really hard to tell if those two are the same. I don't know if anyone's read the paper close enough to know if those are actually the same or different, but either way, it's a problem. There's this little footnote here, which actually gets more at what you said is, well, if we have to print this, we can think of putting dots of ink or something like dividing our square into pixels, but eventually they're gonna be too small and we can't distinguish the symbols. So he had a good reason why the alphabet had to be finite. What about the number of states? Why is the number of states finite? The tape. So the tape is actually not finite. The tape is the one thing that's infinite. And remember what the, the tape is modeling, the reason why the tape is infinite, this is the tape. It's not actually infinite. That physical tape is not infinite. But when he thinks about modeling this, the amount of scratch paper any of the human computers can use to do their computations is reasonable to think of that as infinite. They can keep getting more not really infinite because you need trees to cut down to make more paper and eventually the whole universe, you're going to use up all the trees and not have any paper, but reasonable to think of that as infinite. That's the one thing that is infinite. So why not make the number of states infinite? So it would definitely be harder to draw machines with infinitely many states, but there's no reason we couldn't define a transition function that worked for infinitely many states. But we're pretty good at defining functions on sets of inputs that are infinite. What is he actually modeling with the states? Remember, he wrote about children doing arithmetic as his more concrete thing he wanted to model. What are the states? 
the state is the state of mind of the computer you're modeling. What a human can keep in their mind is limited. That was how he stated the justification for keeping the number of states finite. If what you're trying to model is humans doing computation, it's easy to think of the amount of paper being infinite. It's really hard to think of what you can keep in your head being infinite. This is how he describes that in more detail. And it's kind of the same as the character. If you could have infinitely many different states in your head, you couldn't tell them apart. Just like if you could have infinitely many different characters in one square, you couldn't tell them apart. So both the number of states of mind, which are the number of states in the state machine, and the number of symbols that you can write on the tape have to be finite. That's how we're going to represent our computations with this model. What else do we need to do to have a computing model? We've got to explain how they execute. So that's what we need to do next.